With a new year comes new opportunities. And so I, along with Jeff, want to encourage you to start something new. Get involved in a community group in this series that we're in, Momentum for Life. It's a six-week study that helps us look at our whole lives, mind, body, and soul. And if you're like me, you need the accountability, amen? I mean, you need the accountability to have the fresh start, to do the things that God is calling you to do as a follower of Christ. There are incredible new opportunities, everything from a Saturday afternoon group that's meeting to a Sunday morning group. And so I want to encourage you to get momentum for life and sign up in the gathering space today. Well, about six months ago, uh, in the middle of a series called Amazing Grace, we were talking about seekers. You know, those people who are kind of on the front end of their faith journey seeking Christ in their lives. And we said seekers have incredible questions. Sometimes they make us in the church a little uncomfortable, but they have incredible questions. And it was at the end of that message that I encouraged the church to write their questions out for God. Well, I received over 80 questions that you all had, and and I promised to pray through those. And as I was praying through those questions, one question came up time and time and time again. And that question was, why do the innocent suffer? Why do innocent people, why do innocent children have to suffer? Now, um, we're not the only ones as believers in Christ who ask this question. In fact, many non-believers ask it too. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, a famous atheist named Christopher Hitchens, the author of the book, God is Not Great, died. And he, along with many others, too, asked this question that kind of leads to another question, which is, how can an all-loving, all-powerful, just God exist in a world where there is pain, where there is suffering, where there is evil? How can these two opposing, opposite concepts exist in the same reality? Well, I believe that we are called by God to wrestle with our faith. We're called by God to try to figure out how these two things fit together. Now, too often, I think, in the church that we try to jam them together by saying pretty simple things like, well, everything happens for a reason, so God must have a reason, or, or it happened, so it must be God's will. I don't think that those things usually are that helpful or that comforting, especially when people are experiencing extreme suffering. And so how do we faithfully wrestle with this question? Well, in my quest to kind of find some answers to the questions that you guys were asking, I ran across a book by my favorite, one of my favorite authors and pastor named Adam Hamilton. And he writes a book called Why. And in it are several questions, but this one in particular. And so today we're going to use his structure, his template for wrestling with why do the innocent suffer. And as always, if we're going to talk about God and suffering, we can't talk about that without going to our Bibles. And so this morning, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles or pull out your sermon notes, and we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 1. Now, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. And you may not realize this, but in Genesis, there are kind of two creation narratives. The first one starts at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, and runs through about chapter 2, verse 3. And then the second one starts after that. Now, this is from the first of those creation stories, those creation narratives. It's it's what gives us purpose. It's what gives human beings purpose um, and life. This is Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man, meaning humanity, in our image, in our likeness, and and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, here in Genesis, we have the foundation for what we understand as the characteristics of God, but also the characteristics of us, what it means for us to be human beings. And so in order to understand this question of suffering, we have to have three foundational concepts in our minds. The first of those is God placed us as human beings in charge of the earth. Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, bad idea, right? I mean, it wasn't necessarily God's a great thing that God put us in charge of the earth. Does he realize just who we are? And yet, 
God did. God gave us the beautiful and yet incredibly daunting responsibility of caring for the earth. But I think too often we think that care means ownership. Remember Psalm 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We don't own the earth, but we have the incredible responsibility of caring for the earth. Go back to Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our own image and our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, to rule also means to have dominion over. And when we think about the words ruling and dominion, what what comes to your mind? You can say it out loud. This is participatory. What kind of words or image come to your mind when you hear the word rule or dominion? Kings, right? Monarchies, dictatorships. What else? Power, control, right? I mean, these are the kinds of words that come to our minds, but that's not what God means. God doesn't mean that we get to own the earth. We don't get to control it. We don't get to treat it like we are dictators over the earth. No, when God created the earth, he placed us in the earth to have partnership, to have relationship with God. Do you realize that we are in partnership with God? I mean, think about it this way, ladies. You know, a lot of times when uh, we're pregnant or we have babies, we feel like we're kind of co-creators with the Lord, right? And so in the same way, God has created us to have partnership. Maybe some of you are gardeners and you get this feeling of just creating something from a seed. I mean, we were created to be partners with God. We weren't the only ones. I mean, God has been in this deal of partnership from the beginning, first with Adam and Eve and then Noah and Abraham and, and the prophets and the disciples and Paul and down to you and me. We are called to be in partnered relationship with God. Incredible responsibility caring for the earth. Not ownership, but we're called to care for the earth. Second foundational idea that we need to understand is that we as human beings are free. We are free. Go back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, right? God has given us choices and that we have the right to choose. We can choose right from wrong. It's what distinguishes us, the Bible tells us, from all other creatures, all other creation. We have the choice, the moral and ethical choice between right and wrong. We have the freedom to choose. It's what makes us distinctly human. We are free. And the third of these foundational ideas is that as human beings, we tend to stray. We like to stray. It shouldn't be any surprise that we human beings are sinful. Amen? See, you're not that honest today, right? (laughs) We human beings are sinful, amen? Amen, right? Go right back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, and there you have Adam and Eve, and one day a little serpent comes and tempts Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember the one tree in the entire garden that God says don't eat from that tree? And what do Adam and Eve do when it's all said and done? Both of them eat from the fruit of that tree. They sin. It happens. Now, sometimes we can think, because we're in the 21st century, that sin no longer happens, but you haven't met my three-year-old son named Christopher, you know? I mean, let me tell you how sometimes this happens in his life. On a regular basis, I tell him to do something, and then he does the exact opposite, you know? So one day, uh, just a couple weeks ago, around Christmas time, um, he was eating chocolate he wasn't supposed to, and so he had, like, chocolate stains from his nose to his chin, And I went up to him and I said, Christopher Michael Billups, did you eat the chocolate that I told you not to, right? And with sheer will and determination, he stands there and goes, no, mommy, I didn't eat the chocolate, (laughs) right? I mean, I did not teach him that, right? I did not teach him to lie to me. It was just something ingrained in him. The truth is, it doesn't stop when we're three, does it? I mean, we all have the propensity to sin. We lie, we gossip, we cheat, we cheat, we steal, we lust, and the list goes on and on and on. We human beings have a tendency to stray, a tendency to sin. Foundational ideas. God has put us in charge of the earth. We human beings are free, and we have the tendency to sin. So how does all of this fit in our understanding of suffering? Why do the innocent suffer? Well, I think there are three types of suffering, three types of disasters that we have to think about in order to understand this whole issue. The first of those is natural disasters, you know. 
In 2011, we weren't stranger to natural disaster. From everything from the earthquake and tsunami in Japan to the, the tornadoes in Joplin, right? I mean, we experienced natural disaster in incredible and monumentous ways. And too often, uh, I hate to say this, but I hear preachers say things like, well, that must have been God's judgment on those people. Now, let me tell you, I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe it for a second. Why? Because the psalmist tells us that the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And that means that God created this incredible world and in it, in this earth, in this world, are ways in which the earth sustains itself and repairs itself. What do I mean? Well, Adam Hamilton says it this way, and this is found on page 17 of his book. He says, but today we understand that earthquakes are the result of movement of the earth's plates, a process designed to keep the core of our planet from superheating. It's an amazing feat of engineering and physics. Without it, the earth would not support life. Likewise, the monsoons that bring terrible flooding are a part of the earth's system for cooling our atmosphere. Now, these two processes allow our planet to support life. God designed an incredible earth, an amazing earth, a monumentous design of physics and, and engineering. And yet, sometimes we human beings live too close to plates. I mean, just yesterday, northern Ohio had a four-point uh, earthquake on the Richter scale, just in northern Ohio near Youngstown. I mean, this happened right in our state, right? Uh, this kind of thing happens in our, in our world. And, and, and sometimes we live too close to oceans and and that's what happens. God, uh, we experience devastation. So if it's not judgment from God, then what is it? Where do we find God in all of this? Where do we find God in the way that the earth so reproduce it, or supports itself? Well, I think we find God when we see thousands, if not millions of people, mobilize to, to respond. You know, it's amazing to me the way in which this church responds to crisis, to emergencies throughout the world. I don't think you realized it, but this year alone you gave thousands and somewhat tens of thousands of dollars to help those people in Joplin and in uh, Japan and also in the Horn of Africa. All over the world responding to those persons in need. I believe that's where we see God most present. Where we see people moving and loving people because of the compassion because of what they feel God is calling them to do, natural disasters. I also believe that suffering happens because of human decisions. Uh, more often than not, suffering happens a lot because of human decisions. We are responsible for some of the suffering happening in this world. Every time I think about this, I'm reminded of the, um, the cartoon of two turtles having a conversation. The first turtle says to the second one, if I got a chance to talk with God, I'd ask him why he allows there to be so much evil in the world. And then the second turtle responds thoughtfully, I'd be afraid he'd ask the same question of me, right? Too often, I think we want someone to blame. We want to blame God for all the terrible things that happen in our world and in our personal lives. But the truth is, we're more responsible for things that happen in our lives than we realize. Amen? Amen? I mean, we are. We don't like to think that about ourselves. We like to kind of coat ourselves with like, you know, a better picture than what's really there. But the truth is, suffering happens because of the choices we make. Remember, we have the freedom to choose, and sometimes we choose the wrong thing. Sometimes we sin. Now, our sin not only affects us. I've heard a preacher say that our sin wrecks the world. And that's so true. Our sin does affect the world around us. It affects it in just horrific and terrible ways. And so we have a lot of responsibility when it comes to the suffering that we see in our community, in our city, in our nation, and yes, even throughout the world. Human decision adds to suffering. That leaves kind of one category, which is sickness. What about sickness? Why do people have to get sick? You know, when I was studying for the sermon, I was reading through and looking through uh, things from Chris Christopher Hitchens, this famous um, atheist, right? And I was looking at a particular interview with him and, uh, um, I can't think of his name, Anderson Cooper. And when he was, in, when he was in interviewing with Anderson Cooper, 
he didn't blame God for his sickness. Now, realize that he's an atheist, so he doesn't even believe in God, but he certainly didn't, didn't blame God for his sickness. And I was so fascinated by that because he said, you know, I have a predisposition to esophageal cancer. His father had died of the disease. But then he said, you know, with all the carousing and the drinking and the smoking that I've done in my life, with all the burning the candle at both ends, it's no surprise that I'm dying of cancer. And that was shocking to me just to hear that kind of humility in a person that doesn't believe in God, right? And yet at the same time, I think for us, that's easy to, you know, A equals, A plus B equals C, you know, you do this, you experience this, and yeah, it makes sense that this person is going to die from cancer. Not that he deserves it, not that the suffering is any less um, awful, but yet that it's a part of his human experience. But here's where it gets tough. What happens when a child dies? right? Randomly. Or what happens when a baby is born with a deformity? What then? How do we reconcile that with our faith then? Well, I think in some ways we have to go back to the Garden of Eden. And we recognize in the Garden of Eden that because of sin, because we live in a fallen and broken world, nothing is perfect. We human beings are not perfect. In fact, we're not going to get out of this life alive right? We're not. I mean, our bodies are resilient, but not indestructible. Think about it this way. You know, I am amazed by the technology of my smartphone. I mean, whoever designed this was an absolute genius. I mean, I can do all kinds of things with this phone. Now, this phone, barring that I don't drop it in the toilet or break it on the concrete or misplace it some other ways, this is going to last me two, three years tops. Great invention, incredibly resilient, but two to three years tops. Now think about that in relationship to our bodies. Our bodies on average last 80 years, nearly 80 years, right? On average, last nearly 80 years. Now, how ingenious, how incredible must the inventor of our bodies have been to create a product so resilient, so amazing, so complex that it would last over 80, nearly 80 years. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Not indestructible, but resilient. So, why do the innocent suffer? Why do innocent people, innocent children suffer? Well, I hope today you've discovered that there isn't a simple reason. There's not a simple answer that just covers it all and and keeps us from wrestling with our faith. The truth is, suffering is a part of faith. And suffering is a part of our human experience. You know, I think on a regular basis, We think if we say yes to Jesus, if we say yes to faith, then we're not going to suffer. Everything's going to be butterflies, rainbows, and sweet parades, right? You know, Jesus is in my life, and that means everything's going to be good. But nothing in the Bible tells us that, right? I mean, when you read the Bible, and I encourage you for the new year to do that, when you read the Bible, nothing in here says that you're not going to suffer. In fact, it says the opposite, If you read um, through the New Testament, especially the writings of Paul, he's constantly talking about the beatings and and all the persecution that he experiences because because of his relationship with Jesus, because he's following Christ. In fact, Romans 8.18 says it this way. Paul writes, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Our present suffering... What we experience in this life will not be compared to what we experience, as the song says, when the clouds roll away, right? It is all going to be worth it in the end. 